on your car. Okay, we're going to get started. <clears throat> Welcome to the afternoon session on the 29th. Uh, our next speaker is Alan Mazur from JPL. He's going to talk about test verification, anomaly detection, and configurable telemetry scanning. And you see how I do? Forward yeah. Can I have the, uh, no, what am I looking for? Uh, laser pointer. Here's a better laser pointer if you like. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, so you saw me a couple days ago. Whoa, this is loud. Okay. You saw me a couple days ago and I was talking about uh, <laughs> instrument architectures. Today I'm going to talk about uh, another tool uh, that I've been using mm, for the past 10 or 12 years for, for testing software, looking for, for problems. Um, and part of the reason why I'm presenting this now it really hasn't changed much in the past few years, but uh, JPL is going to make this open source. And so I would love it since I've run out of ideas for this software. If somebody sees something here that intrigues you, uh, please, I'd love somebody else to carry this, carry this ball. Okay, so I think for, for all of us, at least those of us who aren't using Spark Ada, we, we still launch with undiscovered errors. And uh, I, in fact, I was having a discussion with somebody recently who said, he said, I've always written error-free software. And I said, well, if that's true, either the software didn't do much or you just don't know where the errors were. And I think, I think that's a fair statement. And the irony here is that, especially with the process improvements that we've had lately, a lot of hands go over this software. It's not just, it's not just the developers, and, and maybe sometimes on a CubeSat or something, it would be just the developers. But we've got peer reviewers, we've got the integration and test team, we've got Atlo, uh, you also have SQA. So there's a lot of people looking at this software, and still we don't we don't get it uh, completely right. And the other thing that that is is sort of amusing, although it's it's also a little scary, is that sometimes if you look back through the data that you accumulated during all these hours when you were running it, you can see bugs that people didn't notice. And my two favorite examples of that were on a, I did the flight software for Galax many years ago, which is an Earth orbiting satellite, and very close to, to the conclusion of INT, we, we saw um, a weird glitch. There was a heartbeat on the, on the instrument, and we saw that the, it just, just skipped a beat. We thought, wow, that's weird. You know, and so I went back through all the previous telemetry, and it had been doing it once before, too, but nobody noticed. And it's the kind of thing where, you know, if you're in an ops console or something, you're not looking for little heartbeat failures, but it turned out to be significant. It, it was, if I recall correctly, uh, a, a problem with an interrupt, and, and it was something we had to, we had to fix. Uh, another story from uh, Deep Space One, I did the software for the Micus camera, and this was my very first flight software. I'd come from R&D, I had no, I didn't, I really had zero experience, and I, I can tell you honestly, it's like some of the worst software I've ever written, but it did launch. And somebody called me and they said, you know, we think we'd like to try giving a, you know, different parameter to your software than you were expecting, is, is that going to be okay? Because we think this can actually help us. And I said, well, I don't know. I'm on a different project now. Try it. You know, try it in your lab and see what happens. Didn't hear anything more about it. A week or two later, this guy calls me up. He was angry. And he said, the spacecraft saved. And it was your software. Now, keep in mind, I didn't know what saved was. It sounded bad. But I, I had no idea. And so I said, well, you tested it. What happened? And he said, well, I don't know. And he goes back to the test, and sure enough, during the test that they had made on their flight-like environment, it did safe there too. But the operators figured, well, they wouldn't give us software that would save. This must be just some artifact of the test environment. Go ahead and launch it. And so, you know, it's, those, are, those are my favorite stories. A lot of the time, these bugs that you find after launch, there's ample evidence of them before, but you don't have the time to pay attention. And, and you don't... A lot of the time, it's just because you have time constraints. Uh, now, maybe this is more an artifact of, of instrument software. I'm not that familiar with, with the space flight, with the larger systems. But, you know, things run over. You have mechanical problems and optical problems and thermal problems. And, and so your, your test time goes down. The other thing is I, I think the, the, those of us who develop software aren't really that suited to testing. 
It's tedious. I've never yet met a flight software developer who, who said that he enjoyed uh, you know, long duration testing. Some of us just, we want to be writing stuff. We don't want to be testing stuff. And so we, we do bring in independent testers. But the problem with that is that there, there's always a learning curve. The people have to learn enough about the instrument to test it intelligently. And you know, it's, it's kind of a crummy job. Because if you find problems, you upset people. And if you don't find problems, then they say it was a waste of money. So it's, 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 really, not, it's really not a fun job. Now during INT, it's very similar. You, you, have, you have schedule pressures. Errors like that heartbeat that I mentioned might be very subtle. Also at INT, by the time my instruments go to INT, they've typically cut me loose because they don't want to pay for me. It's, it's been buttoned up and, and so, uh, and, and there's, also, there's also trust here. And part of the reason why they cut me loose is because they trust me, for better or for worse. And there's also this attitude that software problems can always be fixed later. So, uh, finally, there's, there's also human factors. People get tired, they make mistakes. Uh, so I already said with, with uh, uh, the safe thing, thing, testers don't always want to question what they're seeing. They don't want to look like idiots if they say this is a problem and people say, oh no, it's not. And the other thing that, that's really pernicious, and I find this problem with myself too, you know, we make, we make procedures so that we can standardize our testing, which is great. But frequently people get into a mode where they just follow the procedure and they lose track of what it is that they're actually testing. So what can we do about this? Well, from my own perspective, I think the, the best thing we can do is make scriptable tests. And uh, somebody was arguing earlier in the week that we need more telemetry. And that is totally true. I was just working on a proposal where they said, the only telemetry we want besides the science data is voltages. I'm like, OK. You know, if that's what you really want, they're adamant. Uh, I, I, think that's, I think that's very short-sighted. Because those same people, if something goes wrong, will want you to tell them what went wrong with no telemetry. And that's not very practical. The, the thing is, is that when you do these, these scriptable, scriptable tests and you, and you have this telemetry, then you need a way to look at the telemetry and see whether your test passed, uh, which is frequently a lot harder than it, than it sounds. So what I've done here is I've come up with an approach where we capture validity rules for all of your telemetry items which you can do while you still have the people familiar with the software on your team, and then you can apply those. And this is great for uh, regression testing. This also lets you take that terabyte of data that you accumulated that nobody's going to look at otherwise and scan it and see if there's something weird in there. Uh, let's see, some, some other alternatives to, to my doing a, a tool. You know, some people will just, uh, they'll just output the telemetry as, as ASCII and diff it or something like that. that. That tends not to work really well in my experience because a lot of what you see in telemetry, it may be different from the previous run of the test. That doesn't mean that it's wrong. So I created a rule-based parser. Uh, and so this, this really has, has two goals. The first is that it verifies my regression tests. So that when I run a regression test, I just pass the output to this, to this rules parser. And I can run my regression test much more often than I could otherwise. And then afterwards, I can just scan the tests that come out of INT and just, you know, even if it's just somebody randomly just letting the thing run or doing random commands, it'll still look for something weird like that missing heartbeat that I mentioned. So the way this works is that uh, it's, it's divided the inputs to this program are divided into two, two parts. There's a protocol specification and there's a test specification. And the protocol specification basically lets you uh, specify a heterogeneous packet stream because you, you will typically have varying types of packets that, that you want to scan. Uh, some of them will be variable length. And I, it has a bunch of built-in data types. You'll see that in a minute. Uh, and then it also has some display formats. So this is an example of, of a protocol spec. And basically, 
here's a definition of a science package. You can see that I think the types are fairly obvious. It's a uh, eight bit int. So this packet starts off with a packet type, packet number, and then we say this packet applies only if this first value is, is nominal. So the, the software will key off of your packet contents to figure out what packet type to use. Here's a different packet, a dump packet. And so these would be two packets that you might get in a typical, in a typical engineering telemetry stream. Uh, you can define your own data types, and I won't really go into that. It's, it's, not, it's not very sophisticated. It's not like a class. Uh, but what it does let you do is uh, treat, for example, if you, have a, if you have a command or an error message or something like that that, that has multiple fields, it lets you group those fields. Uh, and it, it's, it's fairly crude, but you can also have sub-packets. So if you have a, a set of telemetry that, that occurs in many different packets, it'll handle that. So here's an example protocol from, a, from an IMU data stream. And so you can see everything out of this IMU or this GPS has the same header. And then these are, the, these are the fields that I have. So I start with the header, and then I have some fixed point data, and then some, some other types of data that come out in this stream. Now, typical protocols, I've used this on four, five flight instruments. Uh, they'll typically have hundreds of lines. The one from, this was all sparked by Mars Climate Sounder, uh, which is on MRO. And the reason why I developed this is that the telemetry out of that was very, very, very complex. It was, uh, there was a lot of pointing control and it was all table driven. It was just almost impossible to verify correctness without some sort of rule set because it was just too tedious. So in, in practice, these things get uh, to be fairly large. So that's the protocol. And then you can also have a test specification. And so your test specification for each telemetry point has uh, a condition that has to be verified or a condition that you can use to display that if, if that's what you want to do. So for example, uh, oh, and a little bit of nomenclature, in these test specs, the dollar sign refers to the current value of the telemetry point and underscore dollar is the last value. So you can see here that I'm keying on that packet number that we just saw. And in every packet, I make sure that the current value is the previous value plus one. Or in the spacecraft time, I make sure that the time has, in, has increased, but not by any more than five seconds. And so, like I said, these can become arbitrarily complex. Uh, you can also specify sequential goals to be met. So you can say, look for this set of telemetry points to have this state, and then look for this set of telemetry points to have this state, and uh, you can walk it down. It's kind of like a waypoint concept. So we can say we want our first packet out to be a science packet. So we look for something packet number one with a packet type nominal. And then there we might want to look for a dump packet because we're doing a regression test of, <coughs> of our dump capabilities, say. And so you want to make sure that that, that, that packet is in there. Um, So at the end, you'll get out this report that shows, that the, rule, shows the rules that were violated, uh, any conditionally displayed values. Sometimes, for example, if a rule is violated, you'll want to display some other related telemetry points. So you can say, display this telemetry point if this caused an error. Uh, so here's an example uh, from Mars Climate Sounder where we were expecting our times to inc increment every two to three seconds. So I wrote a rule that says either it's our very first telemetry packet or you've just reset, your reset counter has just gone up by one, or your time has incremented either two or three seconds. And in this case, you can find one place where the time didn't increment properly. And so that's, that's something that, that you need to look at. So here's another uh, output example. Here we're showing commands that were received just for context. Here's some goals that I, that I met for my regression test. But here, there's an error value. I got a 42 hex instead of a 2. I was expecting just 0, 2, or, or 40. And so that tells me that, that there's something I need to look at.
Is there somebody uh, there that could mute? Oh, very nice. Yeah, that was amazing. <laughs> okay, this is all. This is also useful for uh, you can just uh, if you have a new telemetry package, you can just show all the values if you want. Another thing that I do is I uh, the thing has an option to generate CSV files or native Excel files. So if you have a telemetry and you just want to dump all the telemetry out as, as an Excel file, you can do that too, which is kind of fun. So in summary, I found that this gives me very rapid repeatable testing during development. Uh, I can run it on my post-launch telemetry, and it really doesn't take any time once those, those files are set up. It allows the expertise to be encoded. So this can be used after I leave the project. They don't need to pay me to look at this stuff. And I, to be honest, I don't want to look at reams of telemetry. And uh, then I've used it on flights after regression testing for just, just a ton of projects. And uh, I'm done. I mean, I, if somebody else has some ideas for what to do with this, I'm going to keep using it. But if somebody else sees something useful that you'd like to try with it, I'd you know, love for you to have it. Any questions? Do you use this for anomaly resolution? Oh, no, anomaly detection. Yeah, yeah. So with the uh, things like the packet IDs, did you have a construct to allow it to roll over and not produce an error? Yes, yes, yes. I mean, w w because you can, you can uh, let's, let's say that it's a 16-bit, then you can just say either the packet ID has gone up by one or the last value is 65535 and this one's zero. These conditionals can get, you know, dozens of lines long if you let them. So yeah, and it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty zippy. I really tried to make an effort to make it efficient. So... Uh, yeah. You said it was planned to be open source. When is the plan? I don't know. It's taking longer than I thought it would. <laughs> um, wait, wait. <coughs> that was for Dave. Oh, okay. Yeah, it always takes longer. <laughs> I, I was told by, by the JPL person in charge of this that the big hang-up is, is export. And he said that just, that just takes a while. I just have to be patient. Yeah, uh, let me uh, recommend you uh -huh. send an email over to Mike Aguilar. <laughs> okay. And because uh, we... A number of people uh, in the community have been working this throughout the year, and he's uh, he's got the ear of somebody at NASA headquarters who can help do this. Interesting. Uh, so I would I recommend. You are where? Uh, at uh, Goddard. At Goddard. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'd love I'd he's love sitting help. Right over there, but he, he okay. Can't go back to work. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, Chris. It's more of a recommendation. A lot of what. Some of the expressions you use are about, if this happens, that has to happen later right? of a certain kind. Yeah. There's a whole class of methods on timed temporal logics uh -huh. where you can say things like, if this happens, that has to happen within a certain amount of time, or I don't care how long it takes, but eventually it will happen. Right. And there are some interpreters for them, although none of them are good and all of them are NP-complete. However, uh, <laughs> with the kinds of conditions you're having, that might not be an issue. But I'd recommend at least looking at it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't show it in here, but you can, one of the things you can actually do is you can save uh, telemetry points in variables conditionally, and then you can go back and check those variables later if you want. Got it, so cool. That kind of a, is, would allow you to do that. Yeah. I don't I, pretend that the syntax is nice, but... It may be that everything you actually need to do from that is already here. Yeah. I don't know that. <laughs> So you were asking for recommendations. One thing is uh, you're defining the, the packet um, with your own syntax. Could you use like XTE or something you know, that's already in the ground database format to define the packet and then, then use the tool? Uh, and so I'm not familiar with that. Would that, um, can I get the, the terse syntax that I have now? I was looking at like UML or something like that, but the, the syntax would just be... The, the syntax in you know, XML is kind of ugly. No, yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. Um, but, X, TCA, so but I, I was just thinking you know, in terms of being able to pass, okay, you already have the definition in the database, maybe in whatever database format's going in the, to the ground system. <laughs> so what, would you, what did you say you recommended? Uh, well, XT... <laughs> XTCE is, is uh, XML telemetry, telecommand, exchange, something like that. Um, yeah. I, I'm not familiar with that, but I'll definitely look at it because 
I don't really, I think that's one of the off-putting things about this is that it's a different syntax. And yeah. Anything else? For reference? For, yeah, for just for you, XTCE is the OMG uh, CCSDS uh, XML method for managing telemetry. Okay. In, in, a, in a very standardized, easy way. Okay, that's great. Are there editors for that too, I assume? No. Okay. Not needed. Not needed. Needed. Okay. Good job. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>